Hello, hello, hello everyone and thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to first say that I um, this presentation will be um, very um, practical and sensible and sort of you know based um, information that you can take away hopefully and that um, and that applies to everyday people but I haven't spent decades of work in MS so while I've researched it a lot and it's part of my work in brain health uh, we we're all learning together at the time but I think I can probably help you with some things um, where am I going to go is that going to work ah, yeah here we go um, yes okay so let's go what I what I want to talk about first because a lot of my work is actually in aging and and looking at older people and not everyone here is actually in the older age group although interestingly you know the world world health organization uh, when they talk about older in a population they actually define older as being an age beyond the median age of the population and that makes it about 38 in Australia it's great isn't it <laughs> it's quite interesting anyway so um so when I when I talk about this I'm I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about um, about the changes or the difference between older people and younger people from nutrition and then we'll look at other things to be do with um, brain health so Almost every piece of nutrition advice that you hear out there in the general press, you know, in the um, Women's Weekly or in the latest bit of stuff that comes off on the television or, or on the radio or whatever, almost all of that applies, whether it's good or bad, to people who are 30, 40 or 50. Um, and, and that's just because that's the way it is. But a hell of a lot of that information actually isn't very helpful for people who are older because, it's, because their needs are different. And so even the dietary guidelines, there are guidelines for older people, but they're sort of hidden. You have to go through appendixes and get to them eventually. So one of the sort of things that's talked about a lot is maintaining a healthy weight range and the like, um, of course. And in younger age, that is important from a point of view of living well in your later years. And again, this not that's not specifically MS specific, but of course it's the same, um, that carrying extra weight makes it more difficult to do things um, but in younger people there's a very strong and an important message to sort of say if you can and when you can when you when you're younger you must be um, looking at losing um, losing weight or bringing your weight down into the healthy range but when people are older things begin to change because changes in physiology mean that if you lose weight in your later years you will lose muscle and that becomes a problem in itself. And I'll get onto that a bit more in, in the, the, in, as we go on. But for everyone, being active remains the um, most important thing. So when we look at this, people from their 60s on, and there's a bit of a ra age range here, although most of you are probably a bit, be up, bit, bit less than that. People who are older need a higher amount of protein than people who are younger. And most people aren't really aware of that. We all just assume that the that the innate, your nutrition needs are about the same throughout age. And actually, lots of people tend to assume that when you're older, you need less of things. There's a general parlance of sort of, oh well, I'm not I'm not doing very much. I don't need very much food. But actually, you need the same nutrients to keep a body going. And I often say, you know, if you look at this structure, apart from my clothes, um, everything is made of food. You cannot maintain a body if you're not putting nutrients in. And when it comes to protein, you actually need extra when you're older. And then you've got the issue around appetite decline. So if your appetite declines um, because of age or because of anything else, you still need to get the nutrients. So the important things on the plate be become the protein foods and the coloured things, the fruit and vegetables, whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean that the grains and whatever are... Um, a problem it's just that if the whole meal has to shrink you need to keep the really nutrient dense ones in wherever possible and then this thing about weight loss not being helpful if as I said before if you lose weight by dieting or by um, you know, taking on the latest diet or anything that doesn't also involve really good exercise and you're beyond about 65, you will lose body muscle. It's a change in your physiology. You can't actually get around it. So while it might, people might think that 
having five kilos lost on the scales is a useful thing, that five kilos may well be largely muscle and that ends up being a problem for a number of reasons we'll get into a minute. So it, it starts to be a diff different thing. Um, activity remains exactly just as important as earlier. So why is this a problem? So when, if, if you lose muscle, your muscle is actually much more than what moves you around. And, and it's actually your protein reserve for a number of other things that your body has to do. So we're not actually eating 24 hours a day, but your body needs protein 24 hours a day. And it needs it to fight off an infection or an illness. If you're walking down the street and someone sneezes in your direction, you are already your body has gone into making immune proteins. Um, when you're, as well as that, your body organs need repair and maintenance all the time. You're always making new heart cells and liver cells and kidney cells and skin cells and whatever. You're always re repairing and replacing. That's always happening whether you're eating or not. Um, you're also having to repair wounds and any sort of surgery and any sort of cuts and scratches and grazes, all those things are requiring protein. And the interesting thing about the brain is that it is dependent on glucose as its fuel, tiny amount of a tiny, tiny amount of other another substance called ketones, but predominantly it needs a fuel called glucose. Now you get glucose from carbohydrate foods you eat, uh, um, various foods, but starches, starches and sugars, and you've got a little tiny bit that's stored in your body, but not much. It'll last you about a day and a half if you're not eating at all. When that, after a day and a half, your brain, which is only 2% of your body weight, it's only this, you know, small amount in this large structure, it's using about nearly a quarter of the energy. It's actually burning up much more energy than the rest of the body combined. So that it's very hungry. And after that day and a half, if you've run out of glucose supplies, you actually change body protein into glucose in order to supply the brain. You can't, there's enormous inconvenience in life, this inconvenient truth, you actually can't change body fat into glucose because that would be great. Then you could just sit and read a book and you know, while you're reading away, it'd be burning up all that body fat, be great, but that doesn't work. What works is you actually take the protein out of your muscles and convert that into glucose and that keeps your brain going. So this is a really important thing because when you're younger, you've got a whole lot of messages on telling you every time you, you eat a meal to, to put any protein that's been taken out of your muscles back again. That's just because we're designed to grow and grow muscles. That's what we're designed to do. But once you're an adult, we're not designed to grow any bigger. So we need, to, well, not taller and more muscly. We'd be giants by the time we were 70 otherwise. So at that sort of age, things start to change. And unless you are doing stuff with your muscles and eating protein, sometimes you can actually lose. And there comes a time later on then that your immune, your ability to fight, to mount that immune response and to repair body organs and to keep your brain fueled and to repair wounds can be impacted because you've lost muscle underneath. Um, so this is a really interesting difference in amongst people. So the emphasis has to be, as you get always throughout life, staying active, whatever you can do. And I realise that, that that is part of the issue in this, but whatever you can do, that's important. Um, and maintaining proteins at the centre of every meal so that when you do have the capacity to replace any protein that might have been lost out of the muscles, it's there. Because we're pretty good at, in the evenings at eating, usually. I mean, the main meal of the day is generally some sort of protein. And I'm going to get into the specific diets that have got different components um, in a while. But in general, the general population is reasonably good at protein in the evening. Moderately at, at lunchtime, it depends. You know, By the time you've had a uh, bread roll with a little bit of meat in the middle, you probably need a little bit more meat and less of the bread proportionally to get that extra protein. But at breakfast time, we often it's often lost. Now, a 30-year-old eating fruit and yogurt can eat so much, and a couple of bits of toast, can eat so much, a larger quantity of food and get plenty of protein. But someone or other with a smaller appetite eating a smaller amount of food, fruit and yogurt is great food, but it's not very high in protein. So you need to think of ways to put protein into meals like breakfast. So... 
eggs and things like that that are high in protein or nuts and seeds which add protein in so things like that it's a different way of working and and as you're and and trying to keep weight stable stay active keep weight stable um, when you're younger if you need to lose weight yes but once you're beyond about 65 not losing weight but staying stable they're the important things just in general nutrition so how does it end up applying when you come to MS? Um, just no matter what's happening in MS, MS there's still the same age-related changes. There's still that in the background. So that, that discussion around protein and doing whatever you can um, that uses whichever muscles are working as well as they can to actually because if you do something that's a reminder to the muscles to pull in protein when it comes that that's those things remain the same um, and you still need the same nutrients for body and brain function the same things so even though people's appetites might decline it's important to focus on making sure that the same nutrients are there to keep to keep the brain going um, as far as coloured foods, or every the colours that are imparted and foods that give them their natural colours, fruits and vegetables and grains and seeds and nuts and meats and all sorts of things, those colours actually come from substances that have an antioxidant and or, and or sometimes both anti-inflammatory um, activity. And what antioxidants do, all they do is mop up the waste products of the normal metabolism of the cell. So a cell that nor is metabolising, it's always producing waste, because that just happens. Those wastes, if they build up around the cell, can cause damage. Tiny, tiny amounts of damage, but over the years that can add up. So if we could, the, all the antioxidants do basically is mop them up and take them away from the cells so the cells are protected. So the more antioxidants you have, the better. Now you'll often hear in marketing, in general marketing, um, or in, you know, when you walk through a chemist warehouse or something rather, sort of the ads on the shelves, that this, this or this antioxidant subject, substance or um, blueberries or whatever it happens to be this week that's the latest, greatest, fantastic food, that if you eat you know, a, a bottle of those or if you eat some of these tablets or if you eat a cup of blueberries a day, that's going to be, going to save you from all sorts of things. But, uh, but that's marketing. Um, all the science consistently says you have to have a whole lot of different ones and they all work together. So all you need to think of is as many different colours as possible at every meal. And not forgetting that things like the, the, the flesh of an apple, which is not, you know, purple or green, or you know, it's this creamy sort of colour, that's actually high in antioxidants. White wine, white grapes have antioxidants, as do red. Um, the flesh of a, an average potato, not our sapphires, which of course are lovely purpley, but the white flesh is also very high in antioxidants. So it combines the purple and the green and the red and the orange and the yellow and the white and whatever. So just thinking about adding extra colours in any way you can in, from foods into meals is helpful then there's, there's a lot of information about omega-3s, and I'll get into that in, great, in, in greater detail, but you still need really good oils. Your brain um, cells rely on a, a number of different oils or, or fats that come from a range of oils that we, that we um, consume. Some of them are fish oil, marine sort of oils that you will we'll know about, omega-3 type oils. Some of them are um, different types of unsaturated oils. But what it seems to be again is we need to have a, a, a balance of those. It, part, of, part, of this, part of the change in the food supply is that um, animals particularly have become more um, sedentary, like all of us, um, and, and therefore the level of omega-3, which is a nat naturally, naturally higher in wild, meat um, and wild um, product has dropped. So if we, we need to sort of balance that by adding some back in. So omega-3 fats come from fish oils, but also from a number of nuts and seeds and olive oil and things like that. So actually adding those good oils back, just a teaspoon here and there, is actually really beneficial. I'll get into more specific. And still, whatever you can do as far as activity remains the same. So um, I've, I've looked a bit at the, um, the resource that's on the website and 
Uh, we're working on maybe doing some, just a bit of um, rejigging of some of the information. Just There's nothing wrong with it. It's just some of it is just um, not quite right. It's just a matter of finding the time. <laughs> So it's not happened yet. But if we look at on the website, some, some of the, the general healthy eating guidelines, remember, remember that when you read these things, that if you're now 65 plus, sometimes you have to go, well, does that apply necessarily to me? There's a few things in there that may not. But beyond that, let's look at the fats. So the omega-3s, um, there's three main groups that we talk about, the EPA and the DHA, don't need to know their, their full names, um, come from marine th sources. Those are, the, those are the two omega-3 fats that are present in, a in large amounts inside the brain. So the rhetoric, of course, and a lot of the marketing say, well, of course, you have to eat them directly in order for them to go and they can be helpful in the brain. And that's certainly true. But interestingly, um, it does say on the website too that ALA is not converted into those two things. So ALA is, a, is another omega-3 fat that comes from mostly from plant well, comes from plant sources but the interesting thing is that alpha linoleic acid and ALA is also if you on that slide there's another thing called alpha li lipoic acid most inconveniently same same um, same um, ALA same t title from that point of view but they're different things so you have to be careful when you're reading the nutritional stuff that you're not reading about something different so the ALA which is an omega-3 fat comes from these plant sources but people who don't eat very much marine sourced omega-3s are very good at converting the plant-based stuff into EPA and DHA. It is converted into them. In a test tube um, situation, in a laboratory situation, it's hard to convert ALA to EPA and DHA. But we know that it happens in the brains of people because if, if there was no conversion, then people who are vegan, who don't eat any fish oil at all, or any fish, would have higher levels of all sorts of disastrous things that apparently these things are meant to save, and they don't. So it seems, this, this is the way it seems, and unfortunately I think probably a lot of the rhetoric that says you can't use plant-based omega-3s and they're, no, you know, they're not going to help you, you have to have fish oils, being a bit cynical, I'd have to say some of that has to come from marketing because it's very important to people who are marketing fish oil tablets that you're going to want to eat lots of them. So um, we have to realise that all these things are important. So oily fish like salmon, sardines and all of those sort of things, they're great sources of really good omega-3s. Um, and fish oil tablets, if you're taking fish oil tablets, again, are a good source of those sort of things. And then the things that are really good sources of the ALA are... Um, nuts and seeds and any sort of oil from those, particularly wal um, walnuts are, are very high in that particular fat and very useful and they're also local which is really a great benefit and they taste good. Um, any other sorts of thing, chestnuts, they're actually interestingly about to be marketed more in Tasmania so um, mustard seeds and oils from it, canola oil, um, um, soybeans and also legumes, they they have an effect that actually increases the ALA. So they're all useful things. All those things are useful for getting the omega-3 fats in. But interesting on the website, it does, for some reason, it mentions cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts. Um, it does say salmon, but that's not that do, it doesn't contain ALA. So I'm not sure where that came from, and maybe we'll fix that. But um, it, that's not really in there. A little bit, but not, mu not much. Um, the other, but the other thing about them is they are also, the process whereby cells work is this process of oxidation. That's how cells do everything they have to do. They, oxidation is a useful thing that burns up calories and does all the things that the cell has to do. But oxidation is the thing that produces those waste products that antioxidants have to mop up. So if you suddenly take a hell of a lot of omega-3 um, tablets, particularly in tablet form, you are putting in a large amount of these oxidants, so you have to balance it with antioxidants to, to avoid um, potentially maybe having an, an addition of this waste product building up that you're not getting rid of. So uh, and that, what I, when I, the reason I say that is to make sure that when you do take these things that you discuss that with your doctor so they know, so that you can work a balance. Don't suddenly decide. I often say to people, if I go into chemist warehouse or 
um, what's called Priceline or something rather to buy some soap or something. There are so many aisles of, of supplements and nutritional supplements down there. Even my brain, and I know I don't need any of them, but my brain is going, there must be something in that aisle that I need because there are three aisles worth. It has to be. So we're, we're driven by the marketing to sort of think, oh, that might, you know, I probably do need that and that and that. And it's fine. No harm in a lot of those things, but make sure you discuss it with your doctor because nutritional supplements can affect your medication and your medication can affect the nutritional supplements and you can do other things. So that's just really important to remember. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying balance them. Um, I personally don't think there is anything so much, there's any superfoods. I mean, everything really is a superfood super to some extent. Um, basically, it's the same thing, like I said, as many different colours. So I always say protein and colours. A protein food at the centre of every meal, surround it with as many colours as you can. Whether they come from fruit and vegetables, whether they can come from grains, seeds, nuts, whatever sort of doesn't really matter and it allows you to actually have a preference for whatever diet plan you might like to follow. Now obviously constipation is an issue for many people and there's a number of fibre supplements and, 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 and it's a functional thing. I, I think I, I see people who often feel like and sometimes the rhetoric in nutrition education is sort of makes people feel like they've done something wrong, they're not eating the right foods, you know, it's all their own fault sort of thing. But actually it's, a, it's often a functional thing that you can't really do anything nutritionally about. There's a certain number of things you can do, but you have to actually realise that sometimes you've got to treat it with some sort of um, medication or whatever to, to keep you comfortable and to keep things moving. But beyond that, fibre of different sorts. So some, some of it's the chewy sort of um, insoluble fibre in bran and, and the bright and brown rice and the like. And some of it's the fibre that is more jelly-like that you don't even really realise sometimes you're having in something like stewed apple, whatever, which has a couple of different types of anything. So fibre, you know about fibre. You know, you know about eating fruit and vegetables and things that contain high fibrous foods. Then there's pre and probiotics. So prebiotics are substances that the the good bacteria in your gut gut like and therefore you eat them and it increases the number of good bacteria in your gut. Probiotics is when you actually eat the, the bacteria themselves in yogurts and fermented foods and um, cheeses, fermented cheeses and the like. Both of those, whichever ones you want, you, you, you're adding, really assist with constipation because at least 40-50% of the actual faecal matter you put out is either alive or dead bacteria. So if we've got a good um, supply of bacteria, that actually produces softer motions that are easier to pass. And so those things are helpful. And actually, interestingly, probiotics probably can't cause you any harm. Uh, you know, And so they might be the one thing that's worth giving a go at if you want to you know, try a, a tablet. And in fact, there's no evidence that taking a probiotic will actually affect any other substance. But if you are going to take one, make sure that you pick something or other and take it for a period of time because just a day here and there won't work. You have to give, you have to give it a chance to, to take up residence in your gut to be useful to you. Um, for some people, dairy is a problem and there's a whole lot of science around that. Some of it's a bit pseudoscience. I've looked into a lot of it. Um, some of it's individual. There is some evidence that some in some people that some of the dairy proteins, particularly when they're concentrated into cheese, can be an issue. But it's actually quite, quite individual, it seems, from what I um, can, can glean from the research. But I'm sure we'll have discussions around that because people often have strong opinions on it. The good thing about dairy foods is that calcium is a very important nutrient and it is easier to get it from foods than it is to, to get it from um, supplements. But if you're not consuming dairy, then calcium is an important nutrient to get from somewhere else. So then I did mention the um, appearance. And sometimes um, you, you, food can only do so much. And of course, getting up, getting about, as moving as much as you can does help and not being dehydrated. So I'm going through the sort of things that are on that Eat Well, Live Well resource 
because you may have looked at it. So food, diet, the brain stuff, really the, we will learn a lot more in the next little while about um, brain health and gut health. There's a lot of discussion in this. Um, I noticed in the sh I noticed when I was somewhere the other day, I noticed an ad for probiotic face creams. I thought, wow. I haven't actually considered how that fits into the scheme. You think, wow, this is the latest thing, so we're going to have it everywhere. I just don't know about it, but, you know. So it's going to be the latest, greatest thing, and the marketers will pull onto it. That doesn't necessarily make it wrong. It just means we have to realise. Um, but certainly there is a link between the health of our guts and the health of our brains. Um, the, the, the bacteria in your gut talk to each other with the same neurotransmitters your brain uses. They don't, anything from your gut doesn't go straight to your brain because we've got a barrier in the brain, of course, but they affect the vagus nerve, which goes from the gut to the brain, and then the brain affects the vagus nerve, and there's a communication both ways. So if you're stressed your brain your your gut is stressed and if your gut is stressed your brain can be stressed so it's a bit of a combination um so again the same sort of things doing those sort of things with gut bacteria but also a, you know a activity and exercise getting out and about and doing stuff avoiding loneliness and whatever and the, and the speaker before was talking about all this sort of stuff those those um things are important but when it comes to gut health, um, and there's a whole lot of reasons why this is, but it seems to be that the more changes you induce in a food from when it came from the tree or out of the ground or out of the water or off the paddock next door or whatever, the more changes that happen to that food before you put it in your mouth, the less it's liked by the gut bacteria. And some things actually might be causing harm to the gut bacteria. Interestingly, there's some stuff recently about um, emulsifiers, uh, um, otherwise known as, um, sometimes they're called stabilizers in some processed foods. Um, and it seems they might be acting like a surfactant, like effectively like a detergent against um, the bacteria. So that's an interesting thing. So if you're eating, you know, if you're making a mayonnaise with an egg yolk, that's not the same as something that you might have made that's got these um, um, and uh, th those sort of stabiliser products added to them. It may be that those are impacting. Basically, you start with foods that are as fresh and, and local and seasonal and whatever as possible, and you do as few things as possible, and you eat as few things that have had that many changes. It doesn't mean you're going to harm yourself by eating one thing that's more processed, I don't really like the word, but processed foods seem to be a bit of an issue. So from a number of reasons. They also, those more processed things, seem to be driving inflammation, which of course is is a big issue to deal with. So um, that's, it, it, it doesn't mean that you, yeah, as I say, it doesn't mean that you can't ever have the, have things that are more processed, it's just useful. So there's a lot of stuff on fatigue and individuals have individual ways of dealing this from a nutrition point of view some people advocate different things um, it seems like that sugar and the sort of treat type foods might have a place but the problem is that com complete denial this sort of like I must never have any for many people actually doesn't help it actually makes it worse because then you end up with the brain where we are hardwired gene um, to um, in an evolutionary sense, to prefer sweet tastes. They're generally safe in an evolutionary sense. So we are, we've we got this hardwired. For some people, they're absolutely fine to avoid it completely. But for some people, that endless must not, must not is actually not helpful because you're putting more negative messages into the brain and end up with this guilt and denial thing. So really finding a place for treats and for those sort of things within that. But for some individuals, um, you know, who are happy, happy to avoid it, um, then that's fine. But what I say to people is try and mix some of those treats in with the beneficial food. So if you really want to have some chocolate, have some nuts and dried fruits along with it or something rather like that. So you're putting a few things in that are giving you the benefits that might balance it up a bit. Just makes it a little bit easier. So then supplements. You need to wave at me, by the way, Angela, when I'm going on too long, just go five minutes or something. Um, so so um, vitamin B12, often often these levels are low um, in MS, but it's very important to have regular testing and then to take these supplements 
when the levels are low, not just take them because you think they might be low. Um, and that's because some things might actually cause problems if you have them, particularly something like... Um, Lately, there's been some discussion around accumulation of iron levels in the brain and dementia. It's not actually specific to MS, but, you know, in cognitive issues that happen. And it does seem that that is possibly elemental iron from supplemental sources. It's actually not related to what you eat. Um, in fact, it's, it's, a, it's something that's gone wrong in the brain cleaning it out. So after it's gone in, it should be moved out again. But for whatever reason, it doesn't go out. A bit like the build-up of amyloid in dementia and whatever. But um, so your body is better able to deal with iron and various substances when they come from normal food than it is to deal with ones that have come in in a, a different form, um, a supplemental form, if there isn't a deficiency. If there's a deficiency, it's good at taking in the things it needs. So it's it's a really interesting thing to, wor to not worry about, but just not to take things without being um, diagnosed with deficiency. And then also be aware that there are medication interactions, especially with vitamin B12. So these things, PPIs that I put up there, that's proton pump inhibitors, they're anti-reflux medications. Now if you're, if anyone's on an Okay. If anyone's on an anti-reflux medication, then what they're designed to do is reduce the, um, the, the, the acid levels in your stomach. And the problem with that, and that that's, that's what they're meant to do and they're good at that, don't stop taking them, but what can happen is that you need the acid to get to absorb B12 down the track. So if you don't have the acid, you can actually be absorbing not quite as much B12 as you thought, and that can be a problem. So all it means is you have to have regular testing to make sure you don't stop taking them if you haven't been told to. And, and also as you get older, your um, ability to absorb B12 um, reduces. So that's, that's part of the reason why it's a thing. The same thing with iron, I mentioned that before. Even a low-level deficiency is going to impact um, brain ability. So it's important to just make sure that that's another thing that's tested, which of course it would be. And I talked about iron and accumulation. Um, there's a, I, I've mentioned a few things there because there are a few things that are mentioned um, in, on the website as um, high in iron. They've got iron, but they're not really, some of those are not particularly high, pumpkin seeds and molasses. You'd have to be eating a hell of a lot. And most people don't have the amount um, that's talked about. but. Um, red meat's the highest source and then other um, foods um, as well that are listed anyway. And now we've only just got to, only got five minutes, we're only at, at that diet plan. So there are a whole lot of different diet plans. And many people are very, very, um, have got a lot of benefit from one or other. But they vary so different. It's really intriguing that when you look at them, the Jelinek and the, the Swank sort of diets are very much towards the almost paleo sort of style, lots, lot, well, lots of veggies and whole grains, but not a lot, sorry, not paleo, the other way around. Um, lots of veggies and the like, you know, no, those sort of things. The difference between the diets is enormous, but people claim from different um, areas and not big benefits. So people who are, who are on um, the best bet sort of thing or even the, the, the Val sort of diet are actually saying, oh, this is, this is made enormous benefits for me but in fact it's completely different to the Jelinek diet so but it does seem like that it, it um that individuals get benefits it does it certainly does seem that the one that the omega-3 supplements if needed are important um and we can discuss this in more detail as we go on I think um, when we were in one of the telelink things, we were having a discussion the other day with the fact that um, I think sometimes people following a very um, fairly rigid diet often taps into um, avoiding feelings of lack of control, like something else is controlling, and if you tap into something, you, you've got control. And that can be an important part of getting through it as well. So if it's not doing any harm, if the diet's not doing any harm and you're actually getting a benefit out of it, then it does, if that's part of the benefit, if part of the benefit is the focus that you have to put onto it, then that is probably very useful for people. But 
um, if it's actually causing problems, um, one girl that I was talking to the other day had had lots of problems when she fell pregnant and eventually moved off the diet and ended up feeling better. Whether that's because of the diet or whether that's just because of other things is, is hard to tell. But for her it hadn't actually um, been the answer that she thought that it was going to be. But it's very individual, again. So the only thing I, I think, you know, and... Uh, it was talked about the last thing, you know, and, and we, it's all very well to say don't stress, don't stress, don't be worried, don't be anxious, whatever. But if you're worrying about every single thing in, you put in your mouth, that's just more worry that might actually then fuel more mental health issues. So to some extent you've got to lighten up and be kind to yourself, I think, um, and try and balance. Allow, I would say for most people, allow yourself the treats, um, occasionally, but balance them with other things. And if you choose to follow a plan, then follow that plan, that's fine. But, you know, keeping people engaged in the community and, you know, getting about and sitting around and sharing meals, that's just so important in life in general. And it, 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 it doesn't matter whether you've got MMS or anything else, really. That's just important. So we have to be able to try and balance that for a happy life as far as anything else. So maybe I'll pause there since I must be close to five minutes and see if there's any questions or throw stuff at me. <laughs> yeah, so we, so we will take some questions. But first, a round of applause because that is an outstanding presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping there's some questions because I've got a couple of burning ones. So let's start. Yep, Sylvia. Just on page four. We'll get the microphone to you. Page four. Um, just on page four, um, you mentioned that vitamin C assists absorption and tea reduces absorption oh yes what yes. type of tea is a black tea or yeah. um, um, if tea? for people who are on uh, so yes i did say that and i skipped over it um iron iron is actually quite a toxic mineral and so our body has lots of ways to not have to take in too much of it if it doesn't so when you're eating it when you're eating um if if your iron levels are low you're actually better at taking an extra and vitamin c can help so if you're eating fruit and vegetables so if you're eating a stir fry you get more you get more iron out of the the meat and the dark green leafy vegetables because you've got a bit of capsicum the tea the tea inhibits in absorption of iron so i say to people try and have the your cup of tea not at the same time as the meal if you've got level live, issues with iron um black mostly that most herbal teas green teas or whatever aren't a problem black tea is certainly um yeah, so just mix, just move it away from the meal. Another question. Who knew about the biotics and constipation? Come on, hands up, be honest. Given that it is one of the major um, mm. uh, symptoms associated with MS, oh, yeah, amazing. So I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, and it, it, it seems like it may well be worth a try and nowadays you've got the, the you know the fridge stable type um, prebiotic probiotics um, things that you have to have to be cold because they've got live bacteria in them but they've just managed to start to develop some spore forming type um, probiotics that work a few years ago there were lots of those around but they weren't really good there's some now that are that are shelf stable so they're actually spores and you take them but you take them but again you need to colonise them into your gut. You've got bacteria anyway, but you want the good ones. So um, that can be helpful. Yeah, and it keeps. When you say colonise, how long is the time frame you take? Um, it's, you know, the, the, thought pro the thought is probably at least a few weeks. You take them every day for a few weeks, see how that goes. But you could keep taking them forever and it wouldn't be any harm. Um, and there's various ones... There's various brands, um, yeah. Peter Candle recommends <laughs> yeah. um, a fish liver, a, a, a small yeah. can of fish liver once a month. What do you think of that? Yeah, <laughs> um, I, do, I do a little radio program after Peter every couple of months. I think it's this, this weekend. No, next weekend. Um, I'm on after him and we often have a little chat beforehand. <laughs> Look, it, um, it's it's a very high source of vitamin. It's vitamin D, vitamin A, um, a number of omega three, some omega three fats. Um, 
Again, it's a, it's an anecdotal thing that works for him. It has caused heaps of trouble for for shopkeepers up in the north trying to keep up supplies, I gather. Um, and if it's come from a good environment, the thing about liver, and that that's fine, but you have to be careful where you get it from for fish liver because if the fish is growing in um, in water that is not very healthy, the liver concentrates mercury and things like that. So it is, it's an interesting discussion. We have had these discussions, he and I. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I can't see that having it occasionally and the, the amount that he's talking about would be any issue. And, you, you know, it's, it's not going to be, mostly it's not going to be harmful. That's the only problem with these recommendations to eat lots of fish. If you can't access, well, we're fortunate here, we can access fresh local fish. And no matter what you like, what you think about salmon, farmed salmon, it is actually farmed in very good, clean water out there. If you don't like that or if you don't have access to that, you know, in other parts of Australia and therefore you're accessing fish, you don't really know where it came from. Some of it might have come out of water that actually isn't very good. And fish do concentrate some. So, you know, it's an, it's an interesting balance. I actually think if you, personally, I think if you can't access really good quality fish that you know where it comes from, you're better off having the meat that grew in the paddock next door because you know where it came from. It's my personal opinion. <laughs> okay. One more. Hang on, I'll bring the microphone up to you. That's all right. <laughs> well, uh, you'll be able to talk louder with this. Thank you. Um, I've been told quite a few times that you should have um, uh, eat a few bananas. Like, um, is that sort of true for the goodness in the bananas? Um, they're high in potassium, so that could be. Um, salt is sodium is an issue because too much sodium un unbalances a number of things. But potassium and sodium balance each other. So lots of fruits and vegetables brings up your potassium levels, and therefore balances down the sodium um, but it doesn't have to be bananas um, any sort of most fruits and vegetables apricots dried fruits most fruit contains potassium it tends to be those sorts of things um, I can't think of any specific reason um, but they also have a number of good soluble fibers or the changes depending on how raw or that that varies that that, that Different in taste is partly a change in um, some of the internal components. Um, so, yeah, I, I, high in potassium. Um, I play golf and, and often I'll see the guy playing golf will always, somebody will have bananas with it. <laughs> and um, I didn't know whether that was an energy supplement or... Well, I suppose it's a complete... It, it, the great thing about it is it's got a package that you can throw away and it's not going to cause any harm. And... Uh, <laughs> And, you know, you can carry them around and, and you don't have to worry about whether it might be treated with a pesticide or something because you don't eat that bit. So, you know, there's a lot of advantages with those sorts of things. Whereas, you know, yeah, um, yeah, um, I Excellent. think it's convenient. Um, I just got a text from, uh, from my beautiful wife who's sitting up here who's embarrassed to ask the question, what about chocolate? <laughs> All right, chocolate. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Dark yeah, dark chocolate. Um, it, chocolate is... It, it, cocoa is high in antioxidants. Dark chocolate is particularly high in antioxidants. It's a great antioxidant food. Um, milk chocolate contains a bit of calcium, so that's useful as well. I mean, I, I, I really think this, this allowing yourself to have some things that, that, give, that give your... that tap into those things that that are joyful without without going over the top i think that's really important i think it's a good we ha, we young people i think often are sort of i don't know maybe they think their lives are too easy so they have to struggle by taking on the latest, latest nasty difficult challenging diet or whatever but you know I, I think it's really important to get that balance so yeah it's good it's good stuff especially the higher the higher the cocoa the better okay last <laughs> question this end Caffeine, the drug <laughs> yeah. of my choice. The, whole, the, the rest of the family won't have a coffee after midday. I'll yeah. have a coffee about 
five to twelve, five to midnight, and then go to bed and I sleep all night without any problem. Am I like trying to kill myself? Or what? <laughs> Look, I, caffeine is not something I'm expert in, but it does seem like people um, have different tolerance levels, and it seems like when you're routinely consuming it, you're, you get used to the levels that you consume. Um, and certainly, if you suddenly decide to take it up, you get this caffeine hangover, which is which is because um, changes in the the, um, the 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 diameter of the blood vessels around the brain, and they they let go. So, it's it's an interesting thing that is um, that is very varied. But there is, you know, the only other thing is that caffeine can increase bladder sensitivity, so it can actually make that urgency worse. But again, when you're accustomed to it it doesn't seem to cause the issue as much i can't drink coffee in the evening as well well i used to be able to so it's an interesting i don't know what that is um yeah but it's not i don't i don't i don't see any harm but it's not something that i'm really expert in uh really helpful information you the, the answer in regards to the chocolate was correct because there's some norman dean so well done thank you very much excellent